Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Signals Notebook Quarterly Connect Community Series. My name is Diana Tran. I am the Seniors Product Marketing Specialist here at RevD Signal, and I will be your moderator for this session. This ongoing Signals Notebook Community Series will be an opportunity for you to learn about newly added Signals Notebook functionality and hear how others are using Signals Notebook to improve productivity and data transparency through enhanced collaboration. This Signals Quarterly Connect will focus on showcasing how Signals Notebook and Cytera DLX work together in, to enable a truly connected lab environment. Our previous sessions have been recorded and are available streaming at Signals Notebook Quarterly Connect Revenue Signals site. Future dates for Signals Quarterly Connect 2024 will be shared later on this year, so I hope you will look out for the dates and join us for future, future programs. Okay. For today's agenda, you will first be introduced to Citera's Digital Lab Exchange. We will then do a short demonstration so you can see the technology in action. Then discuss the impact on the current partnership between RevD Signals and Citera, what it means for our customers. Moving along, we will provide another demonstration, this time on, configuration part, on the configuration part of the technology. And of course, we will conclude um, and summarize today's meeting with question and answer. Okay, so I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker for today's meeting, David Levy, VP of Str uh, Strategy and Partnerships at Citera Corporation. David is an experienced product and account manager leader with over 30 years in the industry. He has a proven track record of bringing innovative and game-changing products to market. During his career, David has launched breakthrough technologies at companies like Water Corporation, Eugenesis Technologies, Cambridge Soft, and RevD Signals. With his deep expertise and keen understanding of customer needs, David has continuously delivered solutions that disrupt markets and drive business growth. Today, he will be sharing his insights on Citera's Digital Lab Exchange technology. Our next speaker, is Jared Conway, Solutions Architect at Revity Signals. Jared is, an, is a veteran in the field of life science informatics with over 15 years of experience spanning research, clinical trials, and commercial analytics. He recently joined the Revity Signals team to help build and deliver scientific focused analytic application on Spotfire platform. Prior to Revity, Jared spent a decade at Spotfire as a senior solutions consultant and solutions manager. There, he worked extensively with top global pharmaceutical firms and CROs on a wide range of analytic projects. With a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry from the National University of Ireland, Galloway, and Master of Science in Bioinformatics from University of Manchester, Jared brings a strong scientific background. Today, Jared will share how Revity is partnering with Citer to bring you the lab of today and give you a closer look into technology. And lastly, we have a guest panelist for today's Q&A portion, Colin Fife, our product manager for integrations and in, in interfaces at Revity Signals. Colin joined Revity earlier this year with a focus on expanding the company's developer relationships. In his role, he is creating customer-friendly documentation, defining development, best practices, and providing practical examples to help customers be successful. Colin brings over 10 years of relevant experience to Revity. He ex previously worked as a software engineer at PayPal and then transitioned into a product management within ISP. With his technical depth and product leadership, Colin is ideally su suited to lead Revity Signals integration interfaces. Today, he'll help answer any questions relating to Revity Signals goal to making it easier for developers to leverage our platform and integrate with our solution. So before we start, I would like to um, launch a quick poll. Um, so uh, we're hoping you would take a minute just to complete the above poll. You should be able to see the poll now. Okay, what's your lab current connectivity? Minimal, partial, or complete? Okay. Well, thank you. And um, thanks for joining us today. 
Dave, I will now turn it over to you to introduce Citera's Digital Lab Exchange. Fantastic, thank you very much, um, Diana. And uh, I appreciate the introduction. Uh, you should all see my screen now. I'm gonna go into presentation mode. Um, so I'd like to take a quick moment to um, thank the Revity Signals team uh, for inviting us today. Uh, as uh, you know, my name is Dave Levy. I'm responsible for strategy and partnerships at Cytera. I'm gonna take you through a brief introduction of the Cytera Digital Lab Exchange technology, um, along with a, a brief video demo of what it looks like from the user's perspective um, with signals. And then I'll turn it over to Gerard uh, for, the rest of the, uh, for the rest of the agenda. So um, we're, uh, the, the Cytera Digital Lab Exchange really looks at um, the challenge of systems integration in the lab from a very different lens. Um, as opposed to being a traditional application or a data lake, the Cytera Digital Lab Exchange platform is really an infrastructure. We call it IPASS, Integration Platform as a Service, IPASS for Science. The focus here really is data mobility. Um, using very modern tools, the ability to provide a commercial configurable platform that has tremendous flexibility to create automations, create connectivity to just about anything in the laboratory. And if you think a little bit about the, uh, the history of systems integration, the ability to connect any two endpoints in a laboratory has really been around for decades. It's you know been 30 plus years since some of the first APIs were developed. And the challenge though with these, with these types of integrations is that they tend to be very purpose-built, very specific. They're not really intended for commercial use. They're very brittle. Um, and if you look at the lab as an interconnected ecosystem, it really doesn't work because you have so many different types of workflows, so many different kinds of automations, the combination of connections that are there is just too broad and it becomes really impossible to manage. And so the different approach that, uh, that Cytera has taken to addressing this problem is to really create this infrastructure that is composed of commercial components that can be configured by our partners or our customers. And these components consist of connection technologies. These connection technologies that you see around the outside here support all types of different kinds of, of, um, of systems that you might find in the lab. Um, and it's designed to accommodate that diversity. So everything from benchtop instruments like pH meters and balances that don't have a PC connected to PC-based instruments that are standalone, to enterprise PC-based systems like your C typical CDS systems like Empower or Chromelion. Signals uh, applications like informatics applications like the Signals Notebook platform, um, LIM systems, MES, and even data lakes really are, have become a very common part of the lexicon of systems integration. All of these can be accommodated through these commercial connection technologies that we've developed and when you plug them into the platform, they announce their presence, they publish what they can do, uh, and it sets up the ability to create these automations. We call them orchestrations, and you'll see them in action in just a moment. And that creates an environment where any of these endpoints can talk to any of the other endpoints. So it's no longer a point-to-point -point connection, it's really a many-to-many ecosystem-based environment where our customers really drive what's talking to what, you can, have, you can have data going in multiple directions at the same time. Um, it really accommodates the modern laboratory today and the kinds of things that, uh, that people need to do. So if you think about the Cytera Digital Lab Exchange platform a little bit from a functional point of view as well as from a platform point of view, functionally what we're doing is providing the three things you see on the screen. Now this is an enterprise platform. We do have users, groups, roles. We can talk a little bit about, more about that if there's questions along those lines. Those typically tend to be sort of in the background. Um, but what Cytera does is it provides this connection infrastructure to integrate the entire laboratory ecosystem. Once all of those components are integrated or a portion of them, it provides the ability to create automations across any of the endpoints using a, a standardized user interface 
that Gerard will talk about in a little while. Um, and then an important distinction that for the scientists in the laboratory, the people that are doing the day in and day out work, the Cytera platform may be virtually invisible. Uh, it can literally fade into, back, into the background like typical you know, infrastructure does, like the wiring or the plumbing in your walls, if you will. It gets things from point A to point B, but you don't really notice it. But the system does also have the ability to create user interaction. If there is additional data that needs to be gathered from a human being, or if you want to have a user look at a particular automation, review the status, and then approve uh, and allow it to continue, you can bring the user into the uh, automation to the extent that you need to, right? And for the managers in the laboratory and the IT professional, professionals, there are dashboard capabilities that allow you to monitor automations in real time, to look at your portfolio of connected endpoints in the lab or across the entire global, uh, global platform as well. So there's a variety of different methodologies for interacting with the system, but our goal is that once these automations are set up, the users in the lab just do what they do and the interaction with Cytera is either prompted or it, uh, it, it may not even happen very much at all. Um, so we don't wanna get in the way of the normal scientific research that's happening. Uh, our goal is not to be a, what we call a destination application, if you will, like Revity Signals, for example. Our goal really is to mobilize data across all of the endpoints. Um, and so when you think about what is, what's really happening here from a bigger picture, if you take a step back, um, the, the lower three quarters of the screen really is the, is the Cytera interaction, that our job is really to bring together these on-prem applications um, that are typically sitting in the laboratory um, with the cloud-based applications that customers are typically using on a day in and day out basis, be they you know, Revity signals or limb signals or limb systems, whoops, excuse me, or other types of environmental, uh, other types of in, uh, informatics applications and bring them all together as if they're sitting right next to each other and mobilize the data across those endpoints at will. Now, that's a very transactional thing, but by doing that, it gives us access to all of those data payloads that are flowing between those different endpoints. And we track that information. The system is designed for operation in a regulated and a quality oriented environment. Um, so the, you know, we're, we're very comfortable working in a GXP mode. By getting access to all of those payloads, it allows us to combine that data, combine metadata from a variety of different sources, link it together and provide very high quality, context-rich content that can be dropped, for example, into data lakes where applications like TIPCO Spotfire uh, can take advantage of it for data analytics. And that's really where a lot of the added value comes, is by virtue of these transactional activities that are happening day in and day out at the lab level, you're liberating this data and creating high quality content that can really then be leveraged in a really dramatic way inside of data repositories like Revity Signals or other data lakes and things of that nature. So with that, we thought we would show you a little bit about what this, what that transactional piece anyway looks like to um, the scientist in the laboratory. And with that, I'm going to drop out of presentation mode and I'm going to start a video and I'm going to narrate through this video. I'm going to, I might move forward a little bit uh, to, to keep it moving. But you should see a typical signals experiment on the screen. Um, this is just kind of a classic example. It com it's composed of a number of different sections, one on environmental monitoring, a section with samples and uh, for chromatography analysis, um, and another section that supports uh, files and OPC-based uh, uh, interconnections. Um, what we're doing here is showing how the, to the end user, what it looks like, right? That through the connectivity, we're able to actually create buttons or menu selections inside of the Revity platform. And when you push those buttons, it actually drives an automation in the background that results in data populating into the, into the signals dialogues. So here, for example, we just interacted with a, 
a temperature and humidity sensor. Here we're going to fulfill a request for a balance where you are going to see some user interaction where the user can select a sample that's been requested. Um, they can select a balance if there's multiple balances that are available. And all of these interactions, if you will, are fully configurable. These screens can be configured and designed um, you know, as needed, right? Um, and here you have an interaction with a Mettler Toledo balance um, where we're actually sending the balance commands. And you can add comments. You could even, if you were doing this on a tablet, you could even take a picture. Um, you can create the memo, you can take readings, uh, you can take multiple readings if you hit the button too soon, um, and it tracks the readings that are rejected. And then when you're done, uh, you select the submit button, and you again will see the data show up inside of the signals platform. So what we're really looking at here is creating a user experience where the Cytera um, uh, environment is supporting the driving application, which in this case is um, in this case is signals, right? Um, and you can see again, we're just walking through a variety of different situations here. You can see we've transferred the samples over to uh, a sequence table, and we'll simply now this is now using uh, working with Chromelion, right? Uh, very similar to Empower or OpenLab, they all work fundamentally the same way. Again, very configurable. Um, where we've put together here a, uh, a sequence that the user can review. They can select whether they want to continue or not. Um, we could configure this so that the user could actually interact with this dialogue and change the content. Um, and that update would go back in both directions, again, to Chromelion, but also back to Signals as well to keep the two in sync. Um, and um, so we've now created a sequence, if you will, in Chromelion directly from the Signals platform. And now when we look at the results, knowing what the name is of the sequence that has been created, it becomes very simple to then pull those results back with a single button click uh, into the Signals platform where that result data could then not only go, let's say, into Signals, but also could be uh, routed into a data lake, uh, into Inventa, um, where basically wherever uh, our common customers need it to go. And that's the actual data as it comes out of Chromelion with all of the significant figures, uh, which can then be trimmed. Finally, just two more examples. Um, there are a lot of systems in the laboratory that are text-based and that still spit out text files. Uh, and so the Cytera DLX platform has the ability to monitor folders to pick up, uh, detect where data has been um, dropped into a folder. We can either operate directly on that data or we can even automatically, as in this example, sweep that data out of a folder and into a secure protected space where the user at their leisure can then come and select the appropriate data to be reshaped uh, and, dropped into, um, and dropped into signals. <clears throat> and then last example here, um, is using working with Unicorn. Uh, Unicorn is a PC-based application that is their API is driven through OPC technology, which is also used for bioreactors. Um, and so, what we wanted to do during this uh, during this session is to give the folks that are watching an idea of how the how the base platform handles a wide variety of the kinds of technologies that you would see in the lab, ranging from sensors to benchtop devices, PC-based instruments, file-based applications, as well as OPC for those of you that are doing bioprocess or working with other OPC-based technologies. And you'll see again the data here will get pulled uh, dynamically out of Unicorn and dropped right into, uh, right into the, signals, um, the signals table here. Um, and so with that, um, I'm going to pause uh, and bring this down and we'll um, turn this over to Gerard. Um, Gerard, if you want to uh, if you want to take over, please go ahead. Thanks, David. I will look to share my screen. Let me switch. 
you should see that in presenter mode now. Um, yeah, uh, following on from the demonstration that, that David just, just went through, as we talk to our customers, um, we see a lot of areas and opportunities where automation and integration can really add value to the scientific workflows um, that our customers are looking to, to achieve and, and gain efficiencies in. Um, when we look at that chromatography example, you can imagine you know, using the DLX platform to automate something that we, we didn't talk about, but maybe moving samples from a limb system uh, to the notebook. Um, and then as David showed, go from there to the chromatography data system using that sample set to transfer that data, get back the results. And in, in a multi-directional fashion, like David talked about, maybe take the peak table from those chromatography results and add that back to your uh, notebook experiment, but then take the additional uh, metadata you have around that run, whether it's the parameters or the method details and persist that in a data repository or store it in a data lake. And today, contrasting that with how that might be happening today, there can be a lot of copy and paste between those systems to move that data a lot of maybe file transfer involved and copying information out of Excel sheets or PDFs and then pasting that into the notebook. So there are definitely efficiencies to be gained there through that automation of those steps. Also improvement in, in data quality because um, we're you know, programmatically and digitally moving that content between the systems. Um, and David also showed integration of benchtop uh, devices. So in, in that case, looking at a balance integration. Um, so a lot of benchtop devices within the lab ecosystem that could benefit from integration, being able to directly call them from the notebook or fire up an orchestration, um, an automation orchestration from a mobile device to transfer that data uh, back to the notebook. And again, today, a lot of that information can be scribbled down on pieces of paper and then uh, at some point later in the process transferred back into uh, tabular information in the notebook, which opens up um, scope for transcription errors and, and reduction in data quality. So improving that and uh, tightening up those connections can lead to higher quality and also improve compliance uh, in, in those aspects as well. We also see in the area of maybe assay automation and um, other processes where there are multiple instruments involved and coordination between those instruments. Again, maybe uh, the notebook, liquid handlers, uh, plate readers, um, where you need to use information that's coming off multiple systems. Again, the automated process there, being able to pick up that information combine it appropriately and transfer it back to, to your notebook can all be streamlined. Uh, through the platform, leading to improved uh, data quality. And also as part of that transfer in your orchestration, you can also process that data if you wanna make some calculations uh, to add additional uh, value to that data that you're writing back um, to the notebook. And as you integrate more instruments across the ecosystem, um, the platform is, is interacting with those, it's capturing that data as it's being moved um, it, it understands what it's connecting to and how it's connecting. So from a lab operations point of view, that information about what equipment is being used, how often, when can all be um, stored and used for analytic purposes. So you can get better visibility on how your infrastructure, uh, your instrumentation is being used. That data can also be then used in, in systems like Spotfire for analytic purposes, maybe to drive predictive analytics, um, uh, drive predictive maintenance uh, schedules around that instrumentation. So all of that metadata can also have value um, in being captured and utilized um, downstream. But that's all from perhaps the, the scientific perspective and um, how end users will interact with the system. There's still some work that needs to happen to configure um, those integrations. So for the second part of um, today's session, we're gonna look at uh, a little bit at what's involved in those integrations and how you set them up, how you establish that connectivity 
um, what an orchestration looks like, uh, how it's configured. So putting on a little bit more of a technical hat here, maybe a more of an administrative hat uh, for this second part of the session. Like Dave mentions, there are connectors into various uh, points within the lab ecosystem and instrumentation connections. All of those connectors typically have uh, events that they fire uh, when something is happening. So for example, for a, a file system connector, it will fire events when a new file is created in a folder you're monitoring or a file is deleted or modified. And connectors typically have actions associated with them. So actions you can execute on a connector. So again, in that file system example, you can read files, you can uh, write files, you can delete files um, on the file system. Um, and when you wanna process um, your data, we have orchestrations within the system. So those can be triggered by user actions like uh, Dave was showing when he was launching orchestrations from directly from the notebook. They can also be triggered by events that are coming from the connector. So for example, when a file event, file creation event uh, is fired, the orchestration, you can have an orchestration that listens for that event and when it's fired, can respond accordingly. And maybe the first thing it does is execute a read file action to get the content of that file, process it, and then decide where it wants to, how it wants to route the data. Um, does it want to place that data into a data repository or a data lake? Do you want to process that data and place it into uh, the Signals notebook as an example? So you'll see more of those as we go through the demonstration. From the perspective of connectors, um, connectors come in a couple of different flavors within the platform. So there are branded connectors. These are application specific connectors that have been developed uh, to address a particular technology. So an example of one of those is the Signals Notebook connector that allows you to communicate directly with the notebook and also wraps some key functions of the notebook, some common um, APIs so that you can easily configure those such as uploading files or updating tables within the notebook. And there are also connectors uh, to different chromatography data systems like uh, Chromelian and Empower connectors there as well. As well as those kind of targeted branded connectors, uh, the platform also supports universal connectors. And these are based on uh, more industry standard communication protocols. So for example, there are RS-232 connectors for integrating with uh, benchtop devices or web services connector for integrating with uh, generally with REST APIs or um, ODBC connectors for SQL uh, connectivity. So, uh, quite a, a good palette of connectivity options and a direction that um, the platform is going is also to deliver derived connectors. So these take universal capabilities and package them up and um, tailor them for a specific uh, instrument or application. So taking an RS-232 connector and having it pre-configured to work with a particular type of uh, balance make and model. And again, the overall strategy is kind of evolving towards having a community um, where connectors can be shared. So any connectors developed by customers or partners um, to enable a community to share those connectors. Again, increasing the availability of connector cadence and the breadth of connectors that are available uh, within the system as well. So let's jump into that demonstration again, maybe from the perspective of an administrator that needs to set up these types of integrations. So I'm currently within the notebook. I'll just uh, log into Saitara here. So we're currently in the notebook. As Dave uh, had showed in an earlier example, you can easily call out to services to get, for example, lab conditions like lab temperatures and things like that. You can execute those directly from within, uh, within the notebook um, to trigger an orchestration uh, in the DLX platform. And that orchestration can have a number of steps to it. 
So on completion of that orchestration, you'll get that information returned and added to the notebook. And in this case, that particular orchestration, if we look at the steps that took place there, had a connection action out to the, the web service to get the details, had so a function transform to process that data in any way that it wanted, and then also had a final connection action to come back and return that data back to the notebook. In a signals, from a signals perspective, you can simply define an external action as you would normally within the signals notebook. Um, and in this case, each orchestration has a specific URL that you can call for its execution. And as part of that call, it also passes in the EID of the uh, element that it was called from. So in this case, it will be passing that grid ID to the, to the orchestration. And that can be used to return the data back to the signals notebook. But if we take a look at what's happening in the actual DLX platform itself, like I said, we're gonna use a couple of connectors as part of this workflow. So a web service connector to make the call out to the API to get the environmental conditions and the signals notebook connector um, that we use to communicate and uh, directly with the notebook. And again, like I mentioned, this has a series of actions associated with the notebook and we've wrapped some common um, use cases essentially uh, as actions. So the ability to upload a file, to add rows to an admin defined table or update sample properties have been pre-wrapped into dedicated actions. But there's also a more general call API action, again, that lets you easily configure an API call from within an orchestration. So the idea is to make these as configurable uh, as possible, so you kind of have low code to no code access to the notebook um, for executing API calls. When we configure any of the connections, we need to provide some details. I won't drill into the notebook um, uh, one because we use our API key to get access to the notebook. We have a look at the web service configuration here. Um, in this case, it's pretty simple. I'm just calling a base URL here um, for that API. Um, I'm not passing any header information. You can also set up some authentication flows if you need to for your APIs as well. And um, so that's the connector configuration that's needed as part of this uh, orchestration. And the second part is the orchestration itself. So in here, you can set up your orchestrations. You can also see which orchestrations have been executed previously and their status. Um, and you can drill into those in more detail if you want to. But here I'm just going to look at this get lab temp orchestration. So it's made up of a series of steps. The first step in any orchestration is how do you want it to be triggered? Um, and in this case, it's user triggered. So it's triggered by calling that particular URL. And I can grab that URL from here, and that's the URL that's used in the external action in the notebook. Um, you have other options. It could be time triggered. So in this case, for environmental conditions, we could grab that um, lab condition every hour if we wanted to and add it to uh, the, the notebook. Or it can be a connection event that's coming from one of your connectors. So for example, like I mentioned previously, that file, file system connector, and um, that could be trigger an orchestration based on a file created event. Um, so there's different triggering options. And then you have steps along the way for what you want to do as part of the orchestration. So in this case, like I mentioned, the first step is to use the web service connector, use a read action on that web service connector that we've configured for the base URL. And in this case, I'm just calling a particular location. It's actually a weather, um, uh, API that's being called here for a particular um, uh, destination. But that returns, we can drill in here in the orchestration editor and get a look at the results that are coming back from that execution. And in this case, I just want to grab the, the temperature information out of that. The next step in the workflow is to use something called a function transform. And this is where we can programmatically uh, utilize any data that's come in from the trigger or from any previous steps and start to uh, manipulate, that, manipulate that data programmatically. 
Um, we can do that through JavaScript today. Um, in the near future, here in, in the next release of the platform, you'll also be able to use uh, Python programming language to come in here and, like I said, manipulate that data uh, as you see fit. And you also have access to other elements within the system if any attachment has come in, such as a file as part of this workflow from a, from a read action, from a connector, you can get access to that. Um, so there's other variables that are available within this function transform. In this case, I'm not doing anything uh, spectacular here. I'm just returning the body that I got from step zero here in my execution. So you can browse here to get any information from the previous step. So you'll be able to see all previous steps, trigger information. You can easily copy any references to any of those elements and use it within your code block here. Uh, again, you can check what's being returned um, as part of this. So again, the output here now just contains the body. Uh, I've stripped out all of the header information. But I could have gone through here and just as part of this, just stripped out the temperature if I wanted to. But I don't need to because I can show you later how I can reference the temperature element from within here. Uh, the final step, again, is to use a connector. So use an out-of-the-box connector to the Signals notebook. Um, use this instance of the connector that's configured to our demo environment and use the action to add um, rows back to an admin defined table. So one of those pre-wrapped actions. And then I just need to configure the options for that action. So I need to I need the admin defined uh, table ID and I get that as part of the trigger. And again, the idea here is to keep this low code and configurable. So here I can reference any element that I have access to from any previous step. And in this case, the trigger comes in as part of the actual uh, trigger here. So I can grab that EID for the grid and use that as my, um, as my ID in the call to the, um, to the notebook connector. And then I need to pass it some data, so it needs an array. And again, I can come in here and look at the elements within there. And I can use my object reference here to go out and say where am i going to get the date time from type date timestamp from where am i going to get the temperature from so again i can browse out in this case i'm grabbing the triggered at which is the time i made the call uh, but alternatively i could come into any like i said any of my previous steps in here and rather than using the time of the the trigger was called at i could come in and grab the actual uh, date time for the that the weather was actually used uh, was actually captured by the service itself same for the temperature i can look for um, the object that i want to use uh, to fill out this temperature field i can run those and test what values i've got coming back within here you can pass in other objects as well so you can hard code strings, numbers, arrays, objects in there if you want to. And you can also add some transformations or operations to that. So if you need to concatenate values or test values as part of this, you can also do that as part of the configuration in the UI here. Um, but once all of those steps are in place, like I said, I can simply copy the, the URL um, of the orchestration, move back to my um, uh, signals notebook in my external action, create a new one uh, that you might want, determine what you're going to attach it to, and then use that URL as the action that gets called from the from the notebook, if that's where you're going to, to have that triggered from. You can also test these executions uh, from within the DLX platform as well. And you can choose whether steps get executed or not. You can apply conditions in here. Um, so you can test values that are coming uh, through the workflow to determine if the step should get executed or not. And you can also respond to any error handling um, that might occur as part of the workflow, whether you want to continue, whether you want to wait on error fail, um, and then take action based on, on that error as well. So trying to make that as configurable as an experience as possible. Um, uh, for setting up these uh, uh, orchestrations um, for your 
your your data processing. There are a number of elements like uh, David had showed, like examples of grabbing user input. Um, so in a number of his demos, he showed uh, opening um, uh, dialogues that allowed you to choose the balance or, or provide additional user input. So those are on a connector. Those are connector by connector basis. You get different options about what user input you can you can provide. Um, so different um, elements can be added to make up the, the workflow. So that was just a walkthrough just to give you guys an idea of what's involved um, in setting up an orchestration, in setting up connectivity uh, to your sources, um, give you some exposure to that um, from a configuration point of view. Again, this is not something that scientists themselves would be engaged in, but um, someone within their organization from an administration point of view would be involved in this setup to enable the scientific workflows. So I'm going to switch back to my PowerPoint. So in wrapping up, um, we're super excited about the expanded partnership with uh, Citara that brings together their digital lab exchange platform with the signals platform. Um, it's a solution that's being provided uh, by uh, Revity Signals directly, kind of end-to-end from a sales, services, and support point of view. Um, and the driver here is to increase data mobility for labs um, and to do that in, a, in a, as configurable, configurable a, a way as possible. So if we... If we're looking at uh, how that can be delivered, you can benefit from the platform from an execution point of view. You can benefit from the connectors that are available out of the box and their low code configurable nature. And putting all of that together, the goal is to enhance the R&D productivity um, and get you quicker to your scientific conclusions. And I think we're gonna open it up for some Q&A at the end here as well. And I think there are already questions coming through. I see things flashing down here in the corner. So, yep. So I'll go ahead and take you want to pass back control to you. Perfect. Thank you. Go back into my presentation mode. Okay. Um, sorry. Not sure why it went back to the first page. <laughs> okay. Now, um, we'll now open up for some Q&A. Uh, &A. Dave, Jared, and of course our guest panelist, um, Colin, will be joining us today. So um, you can go ahead and put all your questions in the, the um, below panel. I'll start with the first question here. Um, and this one, I believe, should go over to Dave. Will there be ongoing enhancements to the Cytera DLX signals connector? Uh, thank you, um, Diana. Absolutely. Um, so we're working very closely with both um, our common customers and the Revity Signals team um, as new requirements or uh, new use cases come out that you know need additional support. Uh, we are, you know, 100% behind continuing to enhance the connector and, and provide the new capability for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, now, what types of mobile, cloud, or on-prem deployment options exist for the current platform today? So the um, the the platform is a. So if you think about going back to the presentation, integration platform as a service. So. Similar to the Revity Signals platform, this is a SaaS platform. Um, it does have components that are designed to be installed on-prem. So for things like uh, balances or applications like uh, CDS applications or PC-based applications or file you know, applications, those do require the deployment of connectors into um, the customer's environment in the laboratory. And there are prerequisite documentation uh, to, you know, what is involved in allowing those to connect outbound to the cloud in a secure fashion that uh, supports our customers, our common customers, uh, security models for cloud deployments. Perfect. Um, so does Citera DLX work with a, in a validated environment? 
Uh, absolutely. So we we had a, a quality management system before we had a uh, uh, before we actually had a product. So we we built this from the beginning with the understanding that it was going to be deployed in a regulated environment. We have all the technical documentation necessary. We've been audited. We expect to be audited again. So that's not a problem. Thank you. Next question. Do you have a working example of connecting with data lake solutions using DLX platform? Oh, we do actually. There's a uh, there's actually some material online. We recently did a webinar with Snowflake, uh, and uh, that illustrates the uh, mechanics and the, some of the use cases. And and there were some customers in that call as well that kind of showcased what they were doing uh, using Cytera Digital Lab Exchange to populate the Snowflake data lake. Um, so I would encourage folks to uh, to take a look at that. And you know we have ongoing discussions with the Revity team as well in different ways that we can leverage data through Cytera DLX for different aspects of the Signals platform. Thank you. Can the system scale to handle large volumes of data transfer across the organization? So like other cloud platforms, uh, I mentioned earlier in my presentation that Cytera Digital Lab Exchange is built using modern technology. So we're using current cloud technologies that are being used by other SaaS platforms. Um, and the system is dynamically scalable, both vertically and horizontally. So we have not uh, run into any limitations in terms of scalability, whether it be volume of instruments, volume of users, the system will simply scale uh, resources appropriate to meet the demand and then reduce them when they're no longer needed. Thank you. Um, I believe this might be a Jared and Colin question. It, it, can Cytera pull data from our Inventa data factory? So today we we don't have a, a connector similar to the, the notebook connector. Um, we would look to address the data factory through the, the likes of the web service connector that's there out of the box. Uh, and as we evolve the partnership, it, it might make sense to get a, uh, an inventive connector in place also. Thank you. Um, how easy is it to connect instruments and configure orchestrations within Cytera DLX? So, um, go I ahead, Mark. You're better to so, handle this than me, actually, at this yeah, point. Go yes. Ahead. Um, hopefully, some of that came through in that second half of the session. So where you got to see the pieces that are involved. Um, so from a connectivity point of view, it's typically um, setting up the actual connectors using the out of the box connectors, either a branded connector or a, um, a, a more universal connector to make that connectivity. Um, I think like David had mentioned, some of those are service connectors that run on the cloud some for connecting to benchtop devices uh, there's a connector component that needs to be installed uh, locally um, for communication with those types of devices and then it that communicates with our cloud system so there's the connector setup um, that can be simply configuration in the cloud or can involve some installation of connectors on-prem in their configuration but it's it's reasonably straightforward and then there's the orchestration. And the orchestration go, is where the business logic kicks in. Um, so again, it can be as simple as moving that data uh, through the system, or you may want to put some additional programmatic logic in there if you want to uh, transform your data in any way, reshape it, do some additional calculations or processing of the data. Uh, that gets wrapped up in the orchestration. So. Um, it, it's a straightforward uh, process. Hopefully you've seen some of that as part of the demonstration as well. Thank you. So on Signals ELN user configuration, could you add more sort of options like um, by last login and notebooks? Also, I need to have an option to display more user information. So um, it's default to 15 users only currently is what uh, the, the um, user is saying. I think this might be a um, Colin regarding our user configuration. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so this is for signals. Um, yeah. This would be, a, a, it may be an enhancement request for signals not related to satire, which is perfectly reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, and I would recommend uh, going through the ideas portal uh, and submitting this if you have not already, and uh, the product management team will, will pick it up from there. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, and then a user asked, is there training going to be available? Um, and I'm assuming this is going to be regarding the DLX technology. Yeah, so Saikara have a, a training academy. So we have online um, options uh, there for training around, like I mentioned, uh, the connectors uh, and the orchestrations, because those are the kind of moving parts, the configurable parts that you need to, to get things set up. Um, and communicating so there is training material uh, available for that and our services team can also engage in, in, in training and mentoring around specific uh, use cases that you might be interested in automating thank you um and then i believe this might be the last question from a pricing standpoint is it a single cost for all connectors or are they available a la carte fashion this might be for um colin Yes, uh, so with when you purchase uh, Cytera, uh, the, the LX Bot performance, you do get the all available connectors. Um, there's a court, of course, uh, if new connectors are added, uh, they're generally made available. And they, uh, in terms of a la carte options, if you need a specific connector, you can always request it and we can work uh, with Cytera to, to see the potential of, of adding new connectors as well. So I apologize. Um, it looks like there's a couple more questions coming in. Can DLX be used to move data from other business systems to and from with Signals Notebook, SAP, for example? Um, that one, guys, or you you can have a, a shot at that, David. Yeah. So so I'll just I'll just make a general comment, and then maybe Gerard, you can even answer it in more detail. So. From the Cytera perspective, there's no difference between talking to an instrument and talking to an informatics application. So we have customers, for example, that are moving data back and forth between LIMS and MES systems. So as long as the system has an API, and going back to a question earlier about new connectors, you know, Gerard mentioned that there are is a portfolio of universal connectors that are out there, and he referenced the web service connector as one example. There's a an RS-232 universal connector, there's a SQL connector, there's an OPC connector. These are designed to be configurable. So if, if I believe SAS was mentioned, if, if there's data in SAS and if it's accessible through, let's say, a web service uh, API, then there's a very high likelihood that we would be able to get it using one of our universal connectors. And that's part of our strategy is to try and build out and invest a lot of time in creating that universal connector portfolio um, that will speed things up dramatically. So we don't have to wait to build, you know, we don't have to build a branded connector for, you know, every single application that comes along. Go ahead, Gerard, if you have any additional comments. Yeah, and, and what you said is spot on there. And there's some, I think some other questions in there about uh, writing structured data to data lakes or data warehouses. For example, there is a, a branded connector for S3 as an example, and there's a branded connector for Snowflake. But then uh, if, if those aren't covered, if your warehouse or technology isn't covered by those branded connectors, it's a, a case of using the universal connectors like the SQL connector to write to a warehouse. Um, uh, and the structuring of the data typically takes place in, the, in that transformation function. So in the demo that I gave, um, I wasn't doing anything really from a programmatic point of view in that function transform. But in there, you could start to reshape your 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 data in JavaScript or Python to um, get the content you want extracted, structure it how you want, and then come back and use one of the connectors to push that structured information uh, down to the appropriate um, the appropriate system, whether that's a web service call to SAP or a SQL call to a warehouse. Um, uh, and it could and it could be both in the same orchestration even you could be pushing different pieces of information to different endpoints if you want okay thank you um are there any plans for an app in the future idea is we'd like to use tablets in the lab but an app would be ideal for that 
from the site uh, too, well I, I guess there's a couple of ways we could approach this gerard how would you like to handle it well, I'll let you talk from the Cytera specific first, um, and then you know, I can uh, Colin and I can pitch in from the Revity side. So, okay, all right. So, so from the Cytera perspective, um, the objective I think to to maximize flexibility um, and minim and minimize work, to be quite honest, is is to leverage some of the newer technologies on the website to recognize the form factor that's being used in the lab and accommodate that real estate appropriately. So uh, a, an example of a, of a practical, tangible use case that is going on right now today is uh, if you have, you know, some workflows are asynchronous, right? You go into the lab and you just need to do something. And we can put a QR code, let's say, next to a balance or next to a bioreactor and a user could go up with a tablet, scan that QR code, which would launch an orchestration. The user would be prompted to log in and that orchestration could have, you know, Revity signals, you know, as part of it, right? So you could be taking a sample from a bioreactor or, you know, executing on a balance, but you could be using a tablet and the Cytera user interface would be easily accommodated on the tablet. Um, the, the signals component of it might not even need to be displayed. It could just, we could just push the data to it. So that's the way that we're looking at handling um, Primarily tablets, you know, phones are a little bit more challenging because there's less real estate, but you can still do it. Um, but tablets are, are easily accommodated uh, from the Cytera point of view. Okay, so um, we are uh, running out of time a bit. So I'll just ask this last question and we can move on to um, the conclusions. Anyone who didn't get to uh, get their questions asked or answered, um, we'll definitely follow up with an email. Do you have a branded connector with Databricks? Do we have a branded connector with data bricks? Mm -hmm. uh, not at this time, um, but I. But what's more important, quite honestly, than whether the connector exists is understanding the use case. So that's a great opportunity for a deeper conversation around what do you want to do with that connector? And what are all of the different endpoints that are involved in the use case? And let's talk about how we would accommodate that workflow, that automation. And um, if a branded connector with Databricks is required and there's a customer that needs it, we'll look into it. Um, if there are other ways of addressing it, we'll explore those as well and see if we can maybe do something immediately. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, now we're just going to move on to uh, launch this quick poll. Um, this is really us to Get to know your feedback um, for any upcoming initiatives for our Signals Notebook Connects. So if you could indicate in the below three options. Okay. Just give it a couple more seconds. Thank you everyone for your feedback. I'll go ahead and close the poll for now. Okay, now. Okay, so thank you for joining us today on our 2023 Signals Notebook Quarterly Connect Community Series Focus on Signals Notebook. We will have our next section in um, January, so please look out for the date once released as we hope you can join us later. Reminder for all the attendees that this presentation that you um, that attended this presentation, you are already registered for the series, so no need to re-register for the upcoming sessions. In between sessions, um, you can stay up to date to Signals Notebooks, new features and functionalities via our What's New section of the website and email communication. Thank you all um, to our speakers and guest panelists for sharing great insights for their presentations and for the great Q&A session. We will address um, the pending questions in the upcoming days as we, share, um, as we will share the presentation and recording. Um, appreciate everyone's time and joining us today. Thank you.